this is the uh, advanced electromagnetic scores uh, PGEE 936 um, and uh, just uh, let me give you some briefing on the scope of the scores um, uh, this is a 60-hour uh, course on electromagnetism for graduate students either seeking the master's or PhD degree in electrical engineering or even in related areas that uh, use electromagnetism as a core basic uh, subject. Uh, this course is part of the Photonics uh, curriculum at uh, the Graduate Program in Electrical Engineering at Federal University of Pernambuco, which we have the acronym PPGEE. Uh, that's the acronym for the Graduate Program in Electrical Engineering. <coughs> Um, <coughs> relative to a traditional uh, undergraduate course uh, in the subject, uh, PGEE 96, which is uh, the acronym for this Advanced Electromagnetics course, um, employs a more in-depth uh, mathematical formulation to solve. Uh, electromagnetic problems. Uh, the tools uh, include use of Dirac's delta function for localized sources, uh, either charges or currents or other source elements, um, solution of Poisson's and second order non homogeneous differential equations by use of the traditional Green's function methodology in 3D space. That's another attribute of the course. Use of special functions and concepts of uh, orthogonality for solving boundary value problems, either in electrostatics or magnetostatics or in conducting media. And uh, we also use ex make extensive use of vector algebra in solving those problems. Okay. Uh, the course mostly covers the part of static fields in which all these mathematical tools are employed. And um, we, in the final part, uh, we assemble Maxwell's equations for dynamic fields. And uh, we explore the homogeneous and non-homogeneous forms of the wave equations and also we have uh, we, we start the discussion on plane waves attenuation dispersion these are treated in the final part of this course uh, the topics uh, um, Generally form, generally form the basis for more advanced applications of ENM theory. The follow-up course, follow-up course in this uh, graduate program in electric engineering in the area of photonics is the PGEE 937, which is called Fundamentals of Optics and Wave Propagation. So in our graduate program, in the photonics area, both uh, PGEE-936 and PGEE-937 uh, together form the foundations of electromagnetics, of static and dynamic fields of the graduate level in the photonics curriculum offered by PPGE-UFB. Uh, I will um, include here, let me open the web page of the, of the course. I'm going to give you the address um, 
in my notes, which are available in the website. Uh, let me just uh, put in here this. If it opens, what happened? Well, uh, let me try again here. Let's see if it's open here. Well, sometimes UFB domain is doesn't redirect it to my web page, so I have to go straight. That's why. Uh, okay, so I'm having a, it's, uh, here some information. The summary I just gave you is written in this part, in the upper part, upper part, information 2021-01. Um, we <coughs> have um, uh, some information to give you. Uh, we are in Recife, Brazil, which is in the northeast part of Brazil. Our university is uh, called in Portuguese Universidade Federal de Pernambuco. If you translate that to English, it's Federal University of Pernambuco. Um, I am uh, Professor Eduardo Fontana, and uh, information on myself you can find in this uh, link, ufp.br Fontana, or alternate, alternatively, Sometimes the FBBR site doesn't redirect for some reason. The, the site that makes redirection is, is offline sometimes. So you can find me at LSI uh, Photonica dot UFB dot BR slash Fontana. That's my coordinates. Uh, this is for uh, sensors and instrumentation laboratory, okay, which is part of the photonics group. We are, um, in fact, housed. In the, uh, I mean, you have uh, LSI, which is our lab, which is in the photonics group, which is a much larger group of uh, professors and lecturers, uh, and which is by, by uh, is included in the, is part of the electronics and systems department, okay, which has several different areas of knowledge and which is part uh, of the engineering school, right, department. This is part of the engineering school she has different engineering departments. And finally, we are part of the uh, UFPE, which is uh, Federal University of Pernambuco. Pernambuco is the state in which Recife, which is the capital city, is located by the sea. So I'm, I'm in fact, I live approximately uh, let's say 400 meters for the from the water front <coughs> from the shocks uh, receive has became uh, has become famous b for having shocks and people have have to be careful before taking a dive in the beach so um, but let's get back to business here so that's my name uh, Eduardo Fontana and uh, course information. As I mentioned, we have the web page. So this is one address. 
go up to my, my name, then you add PGEE936 ENG, which is the English version of this course. Traditionally, we offer this course in Portuguese, but this year we decided to expand our audience and uh, offering this course to in English language. Some people will get involved in the course, uh, not officially, but they might follow the course. I'll give information on Facebook page where you, you people can um, you can register, uh, and that might help on discussion with your colleagues, you know, student mates. Uh, perhaps I mean I'm I'm, I'm going to have a group of students here in Brazil which will follow this class. They will enroll in the program and follow the class. But uh, I mean those who are not officially enrolled, I mean they can enter the group. They can do the homeworks. I'm just not going to be able to correct the homeworks and to make examination with those students. But they can put some questions on the on the group. I hope it's not excessive. And um, they can discussion on, on, on how to solve this or that question on the homework. Okay, so that might help. I might intervene, giving some, some, some insights on how to solve problems that I passed on the homeworks. For the specific students who will stay enrolled in the course, I mean, those will make the homeworks and will be evaluated, okay? So this methodology is uh, approximately what we are going to follow uh, in this course. Um, also, before I forget, uh, we have also our YouTube channel from the PPGEE, okay? This is PPGEE channel on YouTube, which is this one here which is uh, youtube.com, PPGEE, UFPE. And in this YouTube channel, we have several different courses uh, for those people who uh, recorded their classes and uh, made available to the larger audience. But all the courses uh, are in Portuguese except for one which was in English, which I taught some time ago, which is uh, modeling a computer modeling and simulation, which uh, I thought in English because we had some uh, English-speaking students from Pakistan and uh, I decided to make a course in Portuguese and in English. So this semester we're going to make exclusively in English. Now, just uh, uh, using this opportunity, I mean, for the Brazilian students who have some difficulty in the English language, we have this full course in Portuguese in this web channel, okay, in this PPGEE uh, YouTube channel. Um, they can follow the course in Portuguese. I suggest following in English because this is a way of people who need, I mean, engineering, uh, science in general, in the world, has a common language, which is the English language. So uh, we have to be, in our field of knowledge, we have to be somewhat fluent in the language, either in speaking the language or in writing it. So following this course, of course you're not going to learn English by following this course, but I mean following this course in the original English language, you are going to be able you who are not natively speaking English are going to be able to to um, uh, get familiarized with the terminology in the English language and uh, with the terms used and all these terms uh, in science or in general either defined define it in the German language or in Greek or in English later on. So many things that were invented uh, and discovered, they were in the original in the English language. So the, the terms in English are generally the ori original terms that were employed by their discoverers. So that's why it's important to follow the course in the English language. Uh, for my Brazilian students, I also advise to do the homeworks 
in English, even if it's wrong, okay, I mean, people who understand English, they understand what people mean, even if they, they, they don't write, uh, I mean, a perfect English grammar, so we can understand it, so we can do it without a problem. I'm going to, I'm going to make homeworks in English language, and the students will ask them, the Brazilian ones, in fact, to reply to 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 prepare the homeworks in the language. I mean the line of argumentation in in in, port, in, in English, uh, even if it's wrong. I mean, so I can even correct that too. Okay. Uh, just to mention uh, the methodology of the course, we are going to have essentially 24 video classes. Uh, the timing and duration of each video class is very non-linear. Okay, there are some video classes which are short, one hour, sometimes. There are others that might be very extensive, two hours or even two and a half hours. Um, so it's a non-linear process. Um, and uh, distributed through the course, we're going to have six homework assignments. Um, and also, I mean, this for every group of four classes, we're going to have one homework that covers the subject matter of all these four classes. Then we um, uh, make six examinations based on these homework assignments. Based based on the them themes of these homework assignments, uh, as explained down here. Okay, each assignment covers the subject of four classes. Uh, all the schedule of the all the information on the course can be found in the web page. I just just uh, mentioned to you those two either. I'm going to just grasp and show you some details of the web page to show you the schedule, okay, and how is distributed the subjects. Um, let me open here. This is the web page, how it looks like. This logo is a spherical harmonic plot in 3D space. It's a function of uh, two angular variables, polar angle and azimuth angle. And um, that's the log of the course, okay? Um, these are the information I just gave to you. We have uh, in, in this evaluation method. I inf unfortunately, in my interface, I don't have um, a mouse, a virtual mouse to show you, okay? So, but where you read evaluation method is the evaluation method I just told you. Uh, here is the course program, uh, which I'm going to show you my screen. Uh, uh, the references, I'm going to just show you this course program. The references are those. I mean, you have to have access to John David Jackson's classical electrodynamics course, which many of the topics not all of them, but many of the topics uh, are based on this on this book by J. D. Jackson. Uh, also, uh, an important material is the book of Rama Winery and Van Dusser, which is called Fuse and Waves in Communication Electronics. Uh, mathematical tools that we employ, we have a good important reference, which is the book of Afkin, which is called Mathematical Methods for Physicists. Okay. And also we have our own ebook, um, which you can find on the web page. There are links in the course web page, which is called Electromagnetism. Electromagnetism, Portuguese, Portuguese uh, translation for electromagnetics. There are two parts, parts one and two. And uh, these are books which are written in HTML. So, this is good because people, who, because the book is in Portuguese, 
and the people who don't speak the language uh, they can use Chrome to automatically translate the book okay so just put on your screen use the Chrome uh, navigation uh, browser and uh, just asking to put in the English language is going to make a reasonably good translation of the textbook so that's why I mentioned that here um, uh, the program um, of the course you have basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight topics to be covered. Mostly you have static fields. We go all of this is the static fields. And then you have uh, assembly Maxwell's equations here. And then some properties of the dynamics of dynamic fields predicted by Maxwell's equations. So we have, uh, we start with a review on elements of vector algebra, which is very important for the, for the course. For, uh, these are tools important to, to do metho the methods employed in the course. Then we go to electrostatics, either in vacuum and in material media. So we're going to talk about uh, some concepts in electrostatics. Start with an experimental law, which is Coulomb's law. Then we define fields in vacuum. We do all the methodology in vacuum. Then we go to material media. We talk about polarization. We try to give insights on what exactly is those are those concepts. So then after that we go to boundary problems in electrostatics in, in which we use um, methods of solving essentially Laplace's equation. That's when we are going to talk about uh, orthogonality, orthogonal functions, and uh, methods of solving those differential equations which involve partial differential equations. And uh, methods also to solve nonlinear differential equations, which are essentially Poisson's equations. And th that's when we are going to use the Green's uh, techniques, Green's theorems, and the Green's method to solve those equations. Um, we are going also to talk about image methods of solving uh, electrostatics problems. Essentially, this is, uh, is the same thing themes these are the same themes that we do on the grad undergraduate course of electromagnetics but now with some more sophisticated tools mathematical tools we're going to be able to solve problems that we didn't solve then because we didn't have those tools uh, so that's what then i'm going to talk about electrical conduction this is very similar to the undergrad graduate course but now we employ some more sophisticated mathematical tools to solve some additional problems that we didn't do in the undergraduate course. Finally, in the statics part, we go to magnetostatics, either vacuum or material media, also similarly, similarly to the electrostatics. We start with an experimental law which we try, we try to make the, the experimental law very similar to Coulomb's law. And we try to compute the force between current elements in two loops and try to integrate those forces and see what happens. That's the basis for developing all the magnetostatics, either in vacuum or in material media. We are going to talk about uh, magnetization, magnetic dipole, and so on. So, when we finish those, we have all the statics uh, field formulations, all the differential equations. I mean, those uh, Maxwell's equations, which are particular, particularly valid for those static or stationary field conditions. And then we go on to dynamic fields. And we go to Faraday's law, 
displacement current, and then we are ready to assemble Maxwell's equations. And then we concluded two preliminary, preliminary applications of Maxwell's equations, which are the prediction of uh, wave propagation, electromagnetic oscillations. We are going to talk about both um, homogeneous and ho non-homogeneous wave equations and see what type of solutions are, ex are expected from those from those uh, from those uh, you know solutions for those equations and finally we make uh, an additional application in the case of harmonic fields we talk about plane waves and the important concepts which are uh, attenuation and dispersion so this is basically what is the course and now we are ready to start specifically with the first class. Uh, let me just show you something that I was going to show you, but I didn't. Uh, some additional information on the web page. Because before we really start the course, okay? So this is available for everyone, not only the students that, that are enrolled in this, in this, in this class. Um, this is the course timeline. Okay, you have a table here. We can open it and see in details. Uh, they are color coded. Okay, so you have here video. All classes are going to be in video classes. Uh, it's not a synchronous. Um, method okay so video classes are going to be uploaded and uh, people who are in groups facebook or either in the google groups of the enrolled students they will receive information on how these video classes are posted in general uh video classes will be posted either on the on the time of the of the of the class of the lecture or before a little before you people will will know um, so, timeline of the course, uh, we have uh, all the, the classes you can see here, VC 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are video classes 1, 2, 3, and 4. They have the same color here, video class 5 is a different color because it's a new evaluation uh, part. So, 5, 6, 7, and 8, you can see here, they have the same color. So we have the first examination, for instance, in April 16, okay, and so on. We have uh, the distribution of examinations, number of hours on the average, but I, as I mentioned to you, we are, we are going to have a non-linear course, okay? So some classes will be less than two, others will be two or more, and so on, okay? Um, here is also the schedule of deliverables um, of the homeworks, okay? So, uh, so for, for instance, in this class, which is supposed to occur on March 31st, I'm recording that before this date, in fact. Today is one week, uh, I mean, al almost one week earlier. I'm just recording this class. I'm going to deliver in fact, I might deliver immediately. First homework, homework number one. And uh, then on, for instance, uh, April 14, I'm going to deliver homework number two. So by, I mean, for those enrolled students, by April 16, they have to return homework number one. And then... I'm going to evaluate this homework with a written ex examination and probably I'm also going to make an oral examination with those students on their uh, examination because um, it's very possible that um, due to the COVID uh, pandemics, we uh, have to um, 
we have to uh, make remote evaluation. I mean, the students in a Google Meet uh, virtual uh, uh, room, and uh, we do the evaluation. Depending on how many students I have, I might have to, I might need to make an oral uh, confirmation examination to check their knowledge, and also to have an opportunity to uh, to talking to the students which are enrolled. Okay, those who are not enrolled in the course, they might get in touch with me either on the Facebook page or uh, well or through, I mean, directly through the YouTube channel. I forgot to, 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 to show you um, the Facebook page for those people. I mean, both enrolled students and non-enrolled students, I'm going to re I ask them to register in this Facebook page. Uh, I, I didn't encode in this web page. I'm going to do that. I just have the web page of the YouTube class, but let me open the Facebook to show you the address, uh, I will do that now. Uh, let's go to Facebook somewhere here. Uh, just a second, Facebook. Okay, let's go to Facebook. I'm going to directly to the address. Don't pay attention to my own things here. Okay, so I'm just, just going to find the group and write down their address for those of you who are interested in joining it. Uh, what is this? Oh, where are the groups, 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 groups? Oh, here. Uh, somewhere in, where is my group? See all. Oh, right here. That's our group. PGE 96 Advanced Electromagnetics, you can see it on my screen. Uh, let me get the address of the group, which is not showing here. I have to go to my computer to take a look. Let me see here. Just a second. I'm going to write down on the, on the paper the address of this uh, Facebook group. Um, it's not uh, right here. Let's see the address. All right there. Okay. Um, so let me write down the address um, for people who want to join and uh, you know get in touch. A Facebook group. which is uh, facebook.com slash groups groups uh, slash uh, PGEE 936 in English ENG ENG dot 202101, which is the first semester of 2021. So this is the address of the Facebook group where you people can ask to join. Okay. So this is one way to communicate. Uh, I mean, if I, there are 1,000 people asking me questions. Of course, I won't be able to answer. But I mean, if you have some small, uh, you know, activity of questions, we can. Uh, I can intervene. I mean, you can post a question in the group, and people may answer. I might answer too. Other colleagues can answer and start a discussion. So this is interesting. Okay, so we can do that. Right. Uh, let's see how this goes. Okay. Um, let me see if there's any other informs to give you. All the information. Well, maybe we are ready to start our um, our course. Um, okay. Okay. Let's continue. Um, 
Oops, if I forgot anything here. Well, I just mentioned to you that uh, on the references we have my ebook. Also for the Brazilian students, uh, we are going to publish the homeworks. I mean, for all students, either Portuguese speaking or English speaking students, we are going to uh, publish the homeworks on the web page, and we are going to publish the homeworks in HTML. So in the same way. Uh, homeworks will be written in English. Uh, I hope the students, uh, the Brazilian students, can understand it. But if not, again, as I mentioned, you just open the homework in Google Chrome browser, and then you can uh, automatically translate it to Portuguese and can ask me if you have any questions on the meaning of this or that question. Uh, and we can solve it, okay? Well, uh, let's uh, specifically start now the course. We're going to start with um, the first part of the course, which is a review on um, vector algebra. Uh, We're going to talk specifically, uh, let me just talk about the reference for this class. Um, that's what we're going to talk about, elements of vector algebra. Um, we have Afkin, chapter 3, talks about uh, vector algebra in general. Our ebook, chapter 1. And we are going to cover these topics today. We are going to talk about vectors, integration, differentiation. I mean, not today, okay? I mean, this, this, this is uh, the, the whole review of vector algebra, which includes vectors, integration, differentiation through the space, differential operators, differential operators, integral transforms. And specifically today, we're going to talk about uh, very uh, uh, basic concepts, uh, just to, to be complete on the representation of our mathematical elements. We're going to talk about vectors, their representation, how to make sum and product. But those very basic concepts are using used in more advanced concepts to make the algebra work. Uh, we're going to talk about three basic coordinate systems which you guys are familiar with already. The rectangular system, the cylindrical system, and the spherical system coordinates. Uh, Arfkin mentions that there are many more uh, coordinate systems, but I mean, knowing the basic way to build a coordination coordinate system, you can work in any other different system. Okay, uh, we are going to explore just those three because it's already a lot of work just talking with talking uh, about those three systems. And finally, today we are going to conclude the class. Uh, the lecture uh, by defining the way to transform between different systems, how vectors get transformed, and so so on. Uh, the first uh, important element, which we uh, we are talking about, the field theory. Uh, we are going to talk about in electromagnetics. We have a field magnetic fields, uh, we have, uh, you know, displacement field, magnetization field, uh, and other fields, in current density. All of these uh, fields have in common that they, ha they are functions, either scalar functions or vector functions, in general, of coordinates in 3D space in time, so in space-time. So these functions are, these, these elements are functions of three or four coordinates. And in an abstract way, you can talk about functions that depends on multiple variables. For instance, you have a model that depends on different parameters. We have uh, uh, some, some, you know, uh, some parameter, for instance, capacitance of a structure that depends on different parameters. It might depend on more than three variables. OK? 
Okay, so I have functions of different variables. We are going to be working on 3D space in general. Uh, in general, during the static, when you talk to about static fields, we have only coordinates, coordinates in space. When we have the nine dimensional figures, we are going to include the time. But we are going to have both vector functions or scalar functions of coordinates and time, or in the case of static fields, just coordinates. So um, that's what we are going to be talking about mostly. We are going to be talking about things that happen in 3D space. And scalar and vectors, uh, fields general, generally, the fields that we treat are vector fields. So, we're going to talk about vectors, and in we are going to represent, as anybody else does, a vector as a being a line segment, you know, a line segment uh, showing a direction toward. Uh, it, it is directed uh, with an arrow like this. And uh, we have a representation of the vector, a capital letter in general, with a small arrow on top. And the magnitude of the vector we are going to represent by those vertical bars. In general, we have a scalar without the vector. Everything that has a small arrow on top is going to be a vector. Without an arrow, it's going to be... Um, going to be a scalar. Uh, there are some special classes of vectors. I mean, for instance, this, this vector here might be a if field. So it has a unit, okay? So for instance, S in units, volt per meter. Uh, but we are going to need to work with some special types of vector called the versors which are going to have appended, uh, you know, the sign, the circumflex sign on top, um, the hat effect, right? Put a hat like that. And the uh, magnitude of this vector also has, these versus, I mean these vectors, have magnitude equals to 1. So they are non-dimensional, undimensional, right? So they, they are not non-dimensional, they have no dimension, differently than physical vectors that have a di dimension, okay? Um, we can, well, just to, to, to introduce those, uh, we have the sum of vectors, which is traditionally made, as you well know, um, using the parallelogram rule, you have A and B, you pick one of the vectors, for instance B, and you put this at the end of A in parallel, and join those two vectors, and the resulting sum is going to be the vector that goes from the bottom, from the beginning of A to the end of B, to the end of B, so we have the sum A plus B. Of course, I can do the same process going, fixing B and picking A and translated to the end of B, just doing this. Then you have a sum, which is the same result. So we have a first property, which, m which states that A plus B and B plus A are equal. This is called the commutation property. Okay. Um, just to make a, a small uh, addendum here, we are talking about sum, but I have a small, a small, I have a, an important property involving a scalar parameter in a vector, which is when you have a product with a scalar parameter, you still have a vector as a result. Okay. Uh, for instance, if I have a vector which is a. Uh, I can multiply it by a scalar lambda. Let's say that lambda is larger than 1 and larger than 0, in this case here. Then we, I mean, let's say that the lambda is non dimensional. So let's make a scale factor that's non dimensional. 
uh, a-dimensional, we can say two, then you have a vector that is larger than a, okay, lambda a. I can also multiply by a scalar parameter, which is minus one, which means that I simply revert the sense of vector a, like this, okay? If I have a negative scalar lambda, which is large, smaller than 1, you have a vector that is smaller in, in size than A. So we have this special class of products in which you have a scalar and a vector, and you form the product lambda A. If A lambda has a dimension and A has a physical dimension, Lambda A is going to have a physical dimension, which is the product of the physical dimensions of Lambda and A. Okay? In general, we can make multiplication with A-dimensional or non-dimensional parameters. Okay? Um, so, by constructing uh, vectors which are minus 1 times the vector, we can revert, so you can produce the sum A plus lambda B, and let's choose lambda equals to minus 1. So what we have is A minus B. So we can make a difference between vectors. Let's make the construction here. Okay. So we have two different vectors here, A and B. So what we do is to sum A plus minus B. Use the same parallelogram rule. You pick B, translate it to the end of A, and make the resulting vector. So this in practice is the same as uh, Translating this vector to this part. So what happens here? I mean, the rule is we have A and B. To make the difference, you go from the end of B, B to the end of A, you have the difference A minus B. That's the geometrical way to do it. Okay, so it's easy to see B plus A minus B gives A. So in practice, to make a difference, just pick the two vectors, A and B, and construct the vector that goes to from the end of B to the end of A. Then you have, in this sense, A minus B. <coughs> Another important property of the sum is that it's associative, right? You can associate, I mean, it's n different uh, elements. Uh, you can have A plus B plus C plus D, etc. And you can, you can associate in different ways. You can do like this. You can sum A with the sum of the rest. You can, uh, for instance, sum A plus B plus C, then you associate that plus D. You can use different associations, and the result is not going to depend on how you associate all of this, okay? Um, so, Let's see, for, for instance, for three vectors, A, B, and C. So how do you do it? Well, let's make A plus B first. You construct the sum using the rule A plus B. Then we sum this resulting vector with C. You're going to have the vector that goes, uh, I mean, from the beginning of A to the end of C. We already translated C 
to the correct point to start at the beginning of a plus b so then we have the sum of those guys okay so that's the result now we go again we try just we hold a we hold a and make the sum of b plus c b plus c we have this b plus c here again summing a plus the sum b plus c is to start at the in at the beginning of a and ending at the end of b plus c so that's the sum vector which is the same so sum is also associated so a plus b first plus c is the same as a plus associating just the sum b plus c afterwards okay so i understand that you people might be a little bit anxious to uh, to get some more complex algebra but i mean uh, let's start from the simple things because otherwise it already starts complicated so um, one other important operation which is very useful in determining projector projections of one line in a different line is the dot product or scalar or inner product between vectors okay they're gonna see later in this course that these concepts also are applicable in the function space in function function space we have also those properties a scalar product between functions you know uh, orthogonality which uh, is another concept that, that we are going to talk about so um, we have two vectors a and b right um, let's talk about sizes I don't know, I, we are going to formalize better what the size of a vector is in a, in a, min in a minute. But uh, see, I mean, you, you see those vectors, they form an angle alpha, alpha between them. Uh, so I can project B along A and I get this size here. Size of B cosine alpha, right? That's one way of looking at the problem. On the other hand, I can project A along the direction of B and produce this, this size A cosine alpha. Okay, so it's important to know. I mean, these are projections. We define um, a unit vector, the versor that we spoke before, as that having a magnitude equals to one with a hat like this uh, we're going to represent a small letter lowercase letter with a hat uh, that's the representation we're going to have um, so Uh, if we have a dot product between vectors, by definition, I'm going to write here, A dot B is to pick magnitudes of those vectors, magnitude of one of the, of the vectors, for instance, A, times magnitude of the projection of B in A. So the, mag the magnitude of the pro projection is b cosine alpha um, so that's alpha is the angle between those two right so that's what the dot product is um, and as you can see i can i can look at this as being um, a sorry a 
times the projection of B on A, or alternatively, B times the projection of A in B, along B. So we have this first important pro property. So, I mean, this, this operation, this uh, between vectors, which is a product between vectors, I mean, and the product yields a scalar parameter or function, the product between those two quantities, A and B vector quantities, giving a scalar, and it has this property, is a commutative property, A plus B equals to B plus A, right? And we have other additional things that we have. I mean, we have different vectors. Uh, in general, you choose alpha as the smallest angle. We have cosine alpha between the vectors, but also you can choose the other angle, which is 2 pi minus alpha, which is the same result. Okay, It's easier to look at the acute angle, right? Uh, for instance, if we go A and B, almost pi, then you go beyond pi, right? Instead of looking at this angle here, sorry, Instead of looking at this angle here, I just look at the smaller one, right? The result is the same. I mean, cosine of alpha or 2 pi minus alpha is the same. So what happened to the dot product? I mean, the importance of the dot product is determining if, if things have uh, a projection one along the other. I mean, here, dot product is angle is smaller than pi over 2. A dot B is always larger than 0. On the other hand, if the angle is larger than pi over 2, the projection is a negative thing, right? Because I'm projecting toward the other side. So this alpha is larger than pi over 2 and also uh, smaller than pi, right? But even if it goes out to 3 pi over 2, I mean, if you go from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, but they can choose the angle that is smaller than that, I mean, so. So we have A dot B negative. And there's a special situation, which is very important, to determine orthogonality, which is a concept which is very important also in its function space. So we have A and B, the form pi over 2 exactly, we have dot product equals to 0. So this means that, this means that A is orthogonal to B, right? So these are properties of um, uh, that product. There are additional uh, properties uh, which are not in the class notes. And by the way, I just forgot to mention that those class notes that you are looking at on the screen, okay, they are identified here, a number of them. They are available on the web page. I forgot to mention that because there were so many inf information in the, in the start of the class. So all the class notes, all the 24 class notes, uh, which are the class notes that I work during my classes, are available so you can download them and work on them too, you know, and uh, making notes and so forth. Um, there are some additional properties of the dot product that which is not showing the class notes, but we're going to uh, talk about here. Uh, association is important, right? It can make it. Sorry. Uh, before I forget, 
uh, dot product also is important to, to, to differentiate, the nota differentiate the notation, right? Uh, dot product, as the name implies, is a dot between the two quantities, A and B, right? So this is a way to, to, to do it. It's not to do like this. This has a different meaning as we are going to talk, going to talk in a couple of minutes. But the dot product is something that gives a scalar result, right? So uh, you can distribute it, the product between vectors. So dot product is distributed. Uh, is this has a distributive, sorry, distributive uh, property. A dot B plus C plus D plus etc. Simply, simply, I mean, you can sum all these vectors, project the resulting vector. Let's say A is this one, okay? B, C, D are those. So we can project, you can sum the projections individually, B in A, C in A, which is this length here plus this length there, and D in A, which is my this additional length here, or if you want, you sum B, C, and D and project the resulting field along A, which is going to give the same projection. So the distributive property is this, A dot product with the sum of several different vectors, right, etc., can be distributed. A dot B plus A dot C plus A dot plus etc. So that's the, that's the called the distribution product property of the dot product. Okay. Um, next operation, which is very important, I mean, there are some more sophisticated operations besides those that we are talking about here, but we are not going to employ them in the course. That's why we are not uh, talking about them. Okay. So, but some, there's some, I mean, other properties uh, between those things, okay? So, let's talk about the cross product, which is also called the vector product. As the name implies, the cross product uh, results in a vector as a result. Um... So what you do is to to draw the two vectors a and b. And by definition, a cross b cross, right? That's the symbol of the cross product or vector product. You you pick the smallest angle between those two. That's how you define it. Okay, smallest angle. Um, you can also, I mean, in fact, you can pick the largest angle. We're going to talk about that later, but not to confuse things, let's pick, pick the smallest angle. The result doesn't depend on which one you choose. I'm going to just show you, okay? That, that's not, um, I mean, even if you should choose the largest angle, the way we define is going to give the right result. But let's say A and B this offers the smallest angle between those, right? So by definition, you define a versor U, which is orthogonal to the plane that contains A and B, okay, like this, and directed to, uh, to the direction, the sense of U is that in which you 
imagine picking A and rotating imaginarily to B and your thumb will give this direction of you. So that's how you define the direction of you, the sense to, or to where you will be directed. So by definition, uh, the cross product of A and B, by definition, is magnitude of A times magnitude of B sine of the angle alpha. Right? That's the definition. And uh, now, uh, let's explore some scenarios here. I forgot just to talk about to you. Uh, I, I was talking about the dot product. I forgot to talk about one important concept that appears in the dot product. Because we are talking about magnitude of vectors, right? I'm going to go back to vector product. I just forgot about this one. We are talking about magnitude of vectors. Well, imagine that you make dot product A with, himself, with itself. Okay? A dot A. Well, by definition, is magnitude of A times magnitude of A, which is A square, cosine of the angle between A and A, which is zero, which is one here. This gives magnitude of a square, then there's a way to formally calculate the magnitude of a vector, which is calculating the square root of a dot a. This is a very useful method of calculating magnitudes. For instance, in 3D space, you can calculate distances using this concept magnitude of the difference between two vectors will give a distance. Okay? So, that's just a parenthesis. Let's close it uh, because we are talking about the vector product. Let's go back to it. Um, so, that's the definition. So, I was talking about this to say that this definition doesn't depend if I choose A from A to B, or, or going through the other direction, I mean, uh, through the other, you know, through the other, through the other uh, sense. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm going to use the same, the same, uh, I'm going to use now, uh, you going back like this. Let's see what happens to see if there's any inconsistency, right? I have a, sorry. Battery is always low. A and B. Instead of going through, uh, I mean, going through the smallest angle, I'm going through the largest one. Okay. And my U is going to be now the one that goes downwards, like this. Okay, this angle here is 2 pi minus alpha. So, if I do it like this, A cross B is going to be, let's call this U prime, okay? Because U is directed to the top. U is like this. U prime is like that. So, if I did like this, the largest angle between U and B, I use I would use U using the thumb going from A to B on the other hand. So that would give me a uh, magnitude of A, magnitude of B, sine of uh, 2 pi minus alpha. Uh, right? Uh, sine of 2 pi minus alpha, which is, I mean, I can easily see if I have alpha here, that's 2 pi minus alpha. The sine change sign, so this is going to be 
uh, times u prime, right? I forgot. This is going to be minus a times b times sine alpha u prime, which is a magnitude times b sine alpha minus u prime, but minus u prime is u, right? This is u. So it's the same result, okay? So it doesn't matter if you go from A to B going through to along the smallest angle or along the largest angle. But it's easier to think about things going through the smallest angle. You see A and B, I mean you see them just go directly. Look at the smallest angle, go from A to B to calculate, define your U versor and you, you go from A to B to define. Uh, the, do the the vector product, right? But I mean, just if you go to around to the other way, you're going to give the same result, okay? Um, there are some different properties in the cross product. Um, uh, you know, A cross B, uh, specifically, for instance, if the verses are uh, uh, parallel to each other, So if B is parallel to A, this is immediately equals to zero, right? Because you have to have an angle, s because sine of the angle is the parameter that appears in the cross product. Uh, so you have collinear vectors, they have a, a zero cross product. You have to have an angle between vectors to have a non-zero vector product. Uh, also, uh, if A and B, uh, you know, uh, you always have, um, if you go through A through B, if the angle is larger than pi, Right? So you could think about, well, if it's larger than pi, I go to the smallest angle, I get the pro cross product. That's correct. You can just do like this. So A cross B is going to be downwards. You're going to change the direction. If it's smaller than pi, A cross B is going to up, going to be up, right? Also, if you want to go to this larger angle, you're going to have the same argument. The sign is going to be negative here, well, and the u is going to be the vector that goes up, but when you change the sign, it's going to be to the other way. Uh, also, if a and b are orthogonal, we have the maximum value of a cross b, right? Uh, let's put in the plane a and b. A cross B, it's going to be like that. Maximum value, A and B are orthogonal. Uh, A, sorry, sorry about that. Let me just make here. A cross B is simply m magnitude of A, magnitude of B, sine of P pi over 2 times U, which is a unit versor like this. That's the maximum magnitude of A cross B. Right? Some properties uh, of the cross product are important. Let's just notice. Uh, I mean, I have uh, distributive properties, B plus C plus etc. I can distribute those. Right? You can do that. Um, but I mean, so this is a distributive 
property. On the other hand, you cannot commute. So the A cross B operation doesn't commute. If you make A cross B, it's going to be minus B cross A, right? Geometrically, if you can make a drawing here. A and B going through the smallest angle, okay, you can always do that can go to the largest, but then you have to calculate the sign and so on. Go to the smallest angle, which is going to be easier. Oh, sorry, would be here. Let's say the angle is smaller than pi over 2. Okay, A cross B is going to be like this. Magnitudes are the product of magnitudes. Sine of alpha is the element that that appears in the operation. Now, B cross A is going to be the other way, right? So, B cross A is minus A cross B. So, that's the commutative, uh, you know, uh, anti-commutative property of the cross product. If the dot product commutes, that doesn't happen to the cross products, right? Let's not forget that. Um, also, né? also uh, A orthogonal to B, we have different results. A cross B, a dot B equals 0, A cross B not equal to 0, but maximum in magnitude, right? A parallel to B, A dot B not 0, A cross B equals 0. So I have different things for those uh, vectors, okay? Very well. Now let's move on. We are going to now, I mean, uh, it's important to make sum of vectors, subtraction of vectors, product of between vectors, either cross or dot products. So we have to be able to, I mean, th these operations become much easier <coughs> if we make use of uh, coordinate systems in which we can decompose the vector, okay? Um so let's talk about that vector decomposition. We are going to talk about a specific system which is very useful, a orthonormal cyclic basis in which you can decompose a vector. Right? Uh what would that be? First of all, we are going to define a set of three mutual orthogonal lines sorry, orthonormal in addition to orthonormal, also cyclic basis a base of reversers in which we can decompose vectors so as to obtain easier methods to do algebra with vectors. So we are going to choose three mutually orthogonal directions. Let's call those directions 1, 2, one, 3. The arrow at the tip of each line here just indicates that the things increase, the metrics, distances, let's say increase or the variable associated with directions 1, 2, and 3 increase toward the arrow. Okay? And also I'm going to draw those things like this. 1, 2, 3 in a kind of cyclic way. Right? I'm going to define the versors 
along those directions directed to the increase of direction 1, direction 2, and direction 3. Right? And um, what those vectors have in common? What are the properties? We have three mutual, mutu mutually orthogonal verses in which uh, they satisfy AI dot AJ can be written like if I equals J, the dot, the, the unit vectors, right? So AI dot AJ equals to 1 if I equals to J and 0 otherwise. Right? That's the first property of the set of basis vector vessels. And also, the way I draw the coordinate system, one, then I go with my right hand, I keep rotating, I go to two, two to three, three to one, I made a cyclic basis. What is a cyclic basis? A1 cross A2 equals to the third vector, right? A3. Any cyclic permutation that I do here is going to produce the third vector. A2, 1, 2, 3, right? If I go 2, 3, 1, I have A2 with A3 equals to A1. 2, 3, 1. Next permutation, uh, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2. A3 with A1 goes, generates the second one, A2, right? And so on. 1, 2, 3, all the cyclic permutations in this sequence, 1, 2, 3, starting 1, 2, 3, produce the third basis vector. If I violate that, I mean, if I repeat indices, for instance, is zero the result, right? Uh, I mean, have a, a positive property relative to the dot product. Now, uh, if I go, if I violate the cyclic order, then I have a negative result, minus a3. So that's a cyclic basis. So what happens? I can always pick a vector and project it along the three mutually orthogonal directions. So if I have, uh, I'm going to use my straight lines here. If I have a vector in 3D space, I can project it, you know, along the three directions. Right? Then I'm going to have, uh, let's call this A. So this length here is A1. I mean, not length, but I mean this projection, either positive or negative, is A1 with sign. The second projection is A2. The third projection is A3. These are three directions, one, two, three. So it's just by simple construction, right? A is the vector sum of um, A1 plus A2, which is this vector here, plus A3. It's very simple. But what is A1? I mean, the vector A1, which I'm talking about, is the projection times the versor A1. A2 is the projection A2, which is right there, times the versor A2. And A3, which is this one, is the projection A3 times versor A3, which we introduced in the beginning of this discussion. So vector, vector A is simply sum in the three indices of AI, which is the projection along the I direction, 
times AI. Right? What are the projections? Well, let's find it. For instance, who is A1? What do I find? A projection is something that's obtained from the dot product. Okay? So if I make a dot product A with versor A1, this is going to be sum of i equals 1 to 3 ai times ai dot a1 this is delta ij i1 in fact which is a chronic delta i think I, I i yeah i didn't talk about it but chronic delta is this function here is this discrete function i just measured here here i can symbolize this condition the result is 1 if i equals j or 0, i different than j is the chronicle delta between i and j, right? So this delta i1, so there is only one term here, which is a1. So projection a1 is the dot product between vector a and a versor, which is unit magnitude a1. So this module magnitude of a magnitude of a1 cosine between those two which is this angle here oops i have to interrupt not really i'm just gonna load it i'm gonna hold a little bit and just load my pen quickly here a couple seconds to complete this reason here then we make a new recording um, what was I talking about um, well I, I think I forgot <laughs> uh, let's go um, so uh, I mean I think I was talking about this. I mean, calculating projection of one vector along a given direction, right? You just have a vector. You have a direction defined by versor u. The projection, let's call it a u, simply is a dot u, which is magnitude of a cosine of alpha magnitude of u which is one so that's how you calculate projection the final version along the direction to which you want to project your vector okay so that's how you do it uh decomposition of vectors and why is this good well what happens um you are going to uh, simply sum different vectors. You just decompose each vector in the same basis. And uh, A plus B is going to be the sum of the projections times the corresponding versor. So in this notation here, we are going to, we are using that notation which repeated indices mean sum so this not in fact means sum between one and three of sum of projections of ai plus bi times ai to drop the symbol sum summation is just going to simplify just doing this okay Dot product between vet vectors is easier, right? Because the versors are, are orthogonal, right? Versors are orthogonal. Then you can uh, simply, uh, you would have, uh, this is simply what, sum between i equals 1 and 3. 
some of the products of projections. Um, well, the cross product, on the other hand, we benefit from the fact that we have cyclic, a cyclic basis, right? So what is this? I mean, you just calculate one component, then you can generate all the others by doing a cyclic permutation. Let's say uh, direction one ending in one, you have the sequence two, three, one, right? Positive, negative. You have the sets. You just permute two with three, so you have three and two. Keep one there, right? So you have the minus sign. Okay. So that's one component plus cyclic. This is really in Portuguese here. <laughs> Sometimes you're gonna find some p Portuguese words mixed in the class notes. Uh, cyclic permutation plus all the cyclic permutations. So each component of this vector product are going to have two terms each, like this. And uh, you always follow the rule, you know, in the cyclic in the original uh, permuted cyclic sequence, sequence, you have a positive. If you violate the sequence, you have negative. So we have here, just to make the next element, you, uh, I mean, so it's only enough to know one term. So the other terms are very easy, right? Let's go continue with the permutation. Let's go to 3 now. A3, B1, right? 2, 3, 2, 3. 1, 3, 1, 2, A3, B1, minus A1, B3, A2. Next permutation plus 3, 1, 2, 2, 3, 1. I did that already. Uh, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2, and 1, 2, 3. Which is the missing one? Spin the I wanna charge it just a second. Just a minute. Uh, I'll have to stop the recording because I have to, re to charge my pen. Uh, let me just end this argument. The plus um, uh, 1, 2, 3, A1, B2, minus A2, B1, A2. Okay, so that's us, uh, the way to do it. But in fact, I mean, to build the cross product is just enough to build one term of it. All the others just do permutation, secret per permutation you have. I mean, it's just necessary to know one term, okay? Okay, so continuing. Uh, let's talk about basic coordinate systems. Um, we have, uh, uh, we're going to talk about three systems, right? As I mentioned, the rectangular coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, and spherical coordinates in, in the context of defining those systems. And to allow um, expanding this concept to several other arbitrary curvilinear systems we are going to to con conceptualize um, how to build uh, the basis vector of the system in general okay uh, let's start with uh, the XYZ system we have um, I mean the system is built with the three orthogonal coordinate systems axis um, we have uh, X, Y, and Z, right? And we have a point in space which has a triple coordinates, X, Y, and Z. And we have the position vector which in this course 
is a very important actor. It's going to be appearing in every formulation that we deal here, uh, which is the position vector x. So, I mean, to determine the location of a point in space, you determine the coordinates of x. If you project x, as we did before, along the three axes, you're going to have uh, x projection, y projection, z projection. Then you build the vector sum x i x plus a y a y plus y a y plus z a z. So there you have the position vector. Um, well, how do we arrive at the definition of the basis vectors? And, uh, and the coordinate system. We do what we call, you can, you can find that well, very well described in the book by Arfkin, coordinate surfaces. In general, you have a set of surfaces, uh, have a three coordinates in space, without time, space. U, V, and W. Okay. Associated with these coordinates, we have reversers A U, A V, and A W. Okay. These versors are, are, are versors. We are talking about a, a cyclic orthogonal system. So versors are all mutually orthogonal and form a cyclic basis. So the, the coordinate system has to be defined consistently, okay? So we have coordinate surfaces, which we call SU, SV, and SW. So this is, this is a concept valid for any coordinate system. How are those defined? Well, we have three surfaces, we have three coordinates. Coordinate surfaces are, def are defined as the condition constant coordinate. Let's say for u is constant u. Let's say u is a constant ku. Whatever constant it is, we have a, have a set of, let's, let's say, parallel surfaces. Uh, v equals to kv, a set of parallel surfaces. And w equals to kw, a set of parallel surfaces. In general, those surfaces are mutually, you know, uh, orthogonal. Try to draw here. This then I have a third surface here, perhaps. Right? So we have uh, three surfaces. Let's say um, S U S V is the second one. And the one that lies horizontally, S W. Let's make a little mirror, a little flatter to make it. Let's let's say, say that U V and W change very small, so the surface is always always a plane. So we have S U, something like this. Okay. S V is something like that. Okay, there's an interception here. And SW is something like this. I hope you can understand. Uh, maybe I have to make it larger in a second. Uh, let me make the SU like this. Maybe if I paint a little bit, it's better, SU. Then you have... Um, SV, we're going to make something like this, like this, like this, like that. That paint with a different color, perhaps. Okay. And then we make SW. I um, have an interception here, right? All those two surfaces. Then we have one that is... Let's see if I can do it. Something like that. Going back. 
Let me paint it as well. Uh, like a yellow, I see. Okay. So let's see. So we have SU is this one. SV is this one. SW is the one that's horizontal. So you'd have three surfaces. And the verses are verses that are orthogonal to the surfaces. Uh, let's say AU is orthogonal to SU. Directed to which direction? Well, to the direction of increasing U. Okay? AV is orthogonal to SV. Direction of increasing V. AW is orthogonal to SW directed to toward increasing them. So that's the, the way you build a coordinate system. You define the coordinate surfaces and you find the unit vectors. So here we have SU is a vector that does this orthogonal to SU is 90 degrees here, right? SV is the one that is allies on SU but is orthogonal to SV and SW is uh, AW, so we have the three versors of the system, right? That's how you do it. So, how does it work with the XYZ coordinate system? Well, SX is the first coordinate system, is KX. SY, Y equals KY, SZ, Z equals KZ, then you have the versors. AX equals to SX, I mean orthogonal to SX, AY orthogonal to SY, AZ orthogonal to SZ. And then, what are the coordinate surfaces here? Well, X equals a constant. It's a set of orthogonal planes, right? Parallel to the YZ plane, right? Let me erase everything here. We can see more clearly. I'll just erase it. A set of undoes here. That's the way to do it. Okay. So uh, AX is orthogonal to the YZ plane, which is SX. One of the SX equal KS equals KS plane is SX, which is this plane here. Right? So we have the versor. Uh, in fact, it's already drawn here, AX. It's toward increasing values of X. Right? Um, what else? SY is XZ plane, which is this plane here. SY. AY is the versor orthogonal to SY toward increasing values of SY. <coughs> Finally, Z constant is the SXY plane, and you have AZ. So the sequence, the cyclic sequence is AX, AY, AZ. Right? Uh, that's how it is. Uh, what else can we say here? Well, one important question also is what's the distance from the point P to the origin, OP? Well, let's go back to dot product, right? Here is our coordinate system. If I know the numbers x, y, and z, we go to the vector, position vector x, calculate the magnitude of this vector, we have the distance. Or, look, x equals to x, ax, plus y, ay, plus z, az. Magnitude of x equals to square root, as we mentioned before, x with x, x dot x. 
Well, x dot x is easy, right? It's x square plus y square plus z square. That's the magnitude of x. So a simple way to calculate distance, right? Well, if I have two, two vectors, x and y, let's say instead of x and y, let's say x1 and x2. So xi has components xy. ax plus yi, ay plus zi, ay. I'm sorry, az x1 or x2, right? What do you do? Make the difference x2 minus x1. We build that vector. Calculate the magnitude of that vector. Right? x2 minus x1 magnitude is easy to, is easy to calculate, right? Difference between axes. So, I, I mean, you can do a lot of things just with this simple concept of dot product, right? Okay? So, this is inside of the root here. Let me put there. Put this in here. Put in there. You'll increase this here. Okay. So, that's how it is. What else can we say? Well, there's another property of the XYZ system, which is the only system in which this property uh, exists. Uh, the versus AY, AX, AY, AZ are independent of the coordinates of location of point P. Alternatively, uh, AX, AY, and AZ do not depend, are uh, independent of coordinates. I mean, if you have a system XYZ, If you are here in space, in this point, well, the versos are always parallel to the fixed reference frame x, y, z. A, x is this one. A, y is this one. And A, z is this one. That's the ones you use to represent anything in this point. If you go to another point, the same thing. A, x is to this direction. A, y is to that direction. A, z to the other direction. Okay? So, the rectangular system, the Cartesian coordinate system, is the only system in which the unit vectors are independent of the coordinates. Okay? That's the only one. <coughs> Next interesting coordinate systems which is useful when we deal with problems uh, involving cylindrical surfaces. I mean, if you have a rectangular system, if you have flat surfaces that form, for instance, the boundary of a region, then we probably want to use the, um, you know, the traditional uh, Cartesian system, the rectangular system. But if you have a curved surfaces, uh, uh, together with flat surfaces, we can try to use the cylindrical coordinate system in which the coordinate, one of the coordinate surfaces is a cylindrical surface. Okay? So then we have to define our, our uh, 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 coordinate surface. Let's first look at the coordinates of the systems. The first coordinate is the radial coordinate in the plane xy. The second is the azimuthal coordinate. And the third one is the axial axis coordinate. Well, our coordinate is uh, the locus of points 
that are the same at the same distance from the z-axis. <coughs> so if you look from top, okay, let's look at our, I mean, let's make reference to our traditional x, y, z system, looking from top, x, y, Try to make a cylindrical here. Okay. Uh, like that. Well, looking from top, uh, the locks of points that are at the same distance from the z axis, which is this dot in the center here, is a cylindrical surface. The first coordinate of the system, system in this cyclical order is the R coordinates, um, which is this distance. S so this coordinate is always a number which is positive, the smallest value is zero, so it goes from zero to infinity. So for a fixed value of R, you have a cylindrical surface. That's the first coordinate, okay? The second coordinate is the azimuthal angle, which is defined as the angle between a plane, not a plane in fact, a semi-plane, and the x-axis. So you look at this thing here, right? So we have a semi-plane. which has a deviation from the x-axis. That's the second coordinate. And the third one is the plane that is parallel to xy itself. It's the same plane that we define in the, in the xyz coordinate system. So first coordinate surface is sr, which is r equals to a constant. This constant is the radius of the cylinder. Second coordinate is the azimuthal. So the second coordinate surface S phi, which is phi equals to a constant, which defines a semiplane. Right? And the third one is Sz, which is the same as the XYZ coordinate system, which is Z equals to KZ, right? <coughs> so these are the three coordinate surfaces. And from these, we define the three versors, versors, unit vectors, AR, in the order, cyclical order, AR, this is the first one, A phi, AZ. So AR is a versor orthogonal to SR. I mean, it depends on the angle, right? I mean, let's put it in this angle here for this value of phi. AR is the first versor. which is contained in the semi-plane S phi, right? Second coordinate, uh, second uh, uh, unit vector is the A phi, which is orthogonal to S phi, and the, I mean directed to the direction of increasing values of phi. So this is the second versor, A phi, and the third one is the one that goes up from this from this plane of my screen here, which is A Z. So this is a cyclic basis. A R cross A phi equals to A Z. A phi cross A Z equals to A R. A Z cross A R equals to A phi. And they are mutually orthogonal. Okay? This is the triple system in this point. If I went to this point here, we have a different set, AR, A5, AZ is not change. But AR and A5 are different, right? 
So it depends on the angle. We're going to talk about it in a second. But here are the uh, 3D you know, uh, graphics of the, what I just mentioned. A point in space is defined by these three coordinates. R is always positive. Azimuth is between 0 and 2 pi. An axis goes from minus infinite xz to plus infinity. Minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. This is sz as shown. This is sr. And this they have planes right, right here. S phi. Right? <coughs> so that's what you have. <coughs> uh, well, what we have as a property which differs from the property in the XYZ system. AR and A phi are functions of the coordinate phi. Okay? If I'm here, AR points to that direction. If I'm here, it's going to point to this direction. If I'm back there, it's going to point to that direction. Even though the magnitude is unit unitary, but uh, the direction is variable with the angle phi. It doesn't change with translation to Z. It doesn't change if you translate, if you translate along the radial distance but it changes if you do this, you know, if you do this uh, change. Uh, another important question that we want to, to, to try to answer is uh, what is the position vector in this system, right? We know in the car, uh, coordinates, in the Cartesian coordinate system, but what about in this system here? Let's see if we can find it. Well, if you look at this drawing here, you can just project X along the radial direction. The projection of X is R. You can project second components, so the X vector has only two components in terms of those basis vectors. Z R in the radial direction and Z in the Z direction. So X has a simple expression which is R A R plus Z A Z. So X has only two components. The distance to the origin is the magnitude which is root square of R square plus Z square. Right? Uh, how many coordinates does X depend? Well, three coordinates. R, Z, and the third is built in AR. So AR is a function of phi. So in fact, X depends on R, phi, and z, and, and z, which is the third coordinate, right? So we have to be very careful. I mean, do not confuse how many components you have to how many <coughs> variables the things depend on, right? Uh, that's the, the second system that we wanted to talk about. I think we don't have anything else to say. It's important to see the dom domain, right? R is a distance. But it's a distance uh, relative to the axis Z, Z axis, in the XY plane. Now, um, let's go to the last system, at least in our course. Of course, there are many more systems. I, I believe that there are 12 at least uh, African talking about those, talk about those systems. Let's not deal with that now. I mean, even though if you, if you in your professional career, if you might have to deal with one of those, 
depending on the type of problem that you might be dealing with, you know. You might be, uh, for instance, developing a device that has hyperbolic uh, surfaces as, uh, as uh, walls of the device, let's say, and you might have to, to determine that the performance of the device has to solve a boundary value problem with that coordinate system, so you have to use a different coordinate system, right? So, <coughs> um, finally, we have uh, the system, uh, the spherical coordinate system, in which the coordinates are the radial coordinate, which are capital R, to make it different from the lowercase r. It's important to know that um, uh, uh, Jackson used uh, as a radial coordinate uh, in the cylindrical system the Greek letter rho, okay? We don't use rho because we use rho for charge density. So to, to avoid getting mixed up, we just use a small r and uh, large R. Also X, position vector is a capital X in our case. Jackson uses a small case X, but that might be confusing with the X coordinates. So, so that's why we avoid, I mean, you are always use capital X for a position vector, right? <coughs> so um, I'm going to look at the picture here to define to you what are the coordinates a point in space in the x in the in the spherical coordinate systems is defined in terms of three coordinates r, theta, and phi. R is called the radial coordinates. Theta is called the polar angle, and phi is called the azimuth angle. Right. So r in this case is the distance of a point to the origin of the system, which is R, right? Theta is the div in, uh, this deviation angle between the position vector and the z-axis, as the second coordinate. And phi is the distance, um, I'm sorry, is the angle between the half-plane, you know, semi-plane, uh, phi equals a constant, which is the same as the cylindrical coordinates, relative to the x-axis. So these are the three coordinates. Now we have to find uh, what are the unit vectors in the cyclic order. Let's say the cyclic order we produce versus a r, a theta, and a phi. Okay. Also, let's talk before about the range of those variables. R is a positive number, it's a distance, so R is always larger or equals than zero. Phi is the same angle as in cylindrical coordinates, so phi is the third coordinate, goes from zero to two pi. And theta just goes from theta equals zero to theta equals to pi. Because for any theta, I can span the whole space by just changing phi like this, okay? I can do that. So theta is, is only necessary for theta, from theta, for theta to go from zero to pi. Be careful because other books change the position of theta and phi. We are going to use the traditional concept in which theta is the second angle, which is the polar angle. So theta goes from zero, which is the z-axis, to pi. Okay? And phi is the azimuth, it goes from zero to two pi. So the coordinate surface are SR, S theta, the second one, and S phi. SR is uh, R equals a constant, which is a sphere. Uh, 
let's say Kr, Kr is the radius of the sphere. So Ar is a versor which is orthogonal to Sr. The second versor, uh, we have to find which, which surface S theta. S theta is a surface which has an angle fixed. So we have a conical surface. This is one pos possible conical surface. The other one is like this. Right? So for that is smaller than pi over 2, you have this one. Between pi over 2 and pi, you have this one here. Right? So um, this is the S theta. So A theta is a versor that uh, points towards the increasing increase of theta is orthogonal to AR. And finally, A phi is the same one as we have for the cylindrical system, which is the one that's orthogonal to S phi, which is the F plane, same infinite plane, right? So we have the sequence AR, A theta, and A phi, that cyclic orthonormal, orthonormal basis in this sequence, right? A R first, A theta second, A phi third. It's important to keep this order, right? Uh, well, position vector now has only one component because position vector is collinear with versor A R, so X equals to R A R, right? And finally, so the distance from a point to, to, the, to the origin is simply r, right? Is the distance. So what are the dependencies of the versors in this coordinate system? Well, ar changes with the azimuth angle. If I go here, this is a different ar. If I change the, the angle, the polar angle, I can go to a different point, then I have a different, I'm sorry, a different AR. So AR is a function of two coordinates, which are the angular coordinates of the system. Same thing for a theta, a theta here points here, and a theta there points there, it changes with phi, and also changes with theta. So it's a function of two variables. On the other hand, a phi doesn't change, okay, if I change theta. It's always the same. A phi depends only on phi, as we showed in the cylindrical system, okay? Um, finally, I would like to talk about coordinate transformations. Um, sometimes we have a um, vector uh, expressed in one system and you want to change to a different system. I'm going to do some algebra here just to illustrate how you do this calculation. Of course, sometimes you also have to change the coordinates, right? Just raise those things. Um, let's say that you have a vector expressed in coordinate system, so it means that you know, I mean, you know the point x, y, and z, right? So you, and you know the coordinates. So you have the components of vector A in the x, y, z system. Suppose, for instance, that you want to change this vector to the cylindrical system. So it means that you have to find components a r, a phi, <coughs> and a z. You want to go to a different system. Of course, we, we already know that a z is the same, right? It doesn't change. If it's the same component, the same in the same direction, it's not going to change. I mean, we want to relate AX and AYs 
with a R and a phi. So we use the concept of dot product. For instance, AR is simply the projection of A in the R direction, right? But A is given, you know those values here. You don't know, you know a, a, AX and AY. AZ is already known. So AZ in the system is the, the same as that one. I want to find those ones. Those are the incognitas, unknown values, right? So A phi equals to A dot A phi. What do you do here? Well, just pick the known components and make a dot product with AR and A phi. So you're going to find that you have AX, AX, AR plus AY, AY, AR. Same thing here, AX, AX, A phi plus AY, AY, A phi. So all I have to do is to calculate those dot products, which is not difficult to do. Here are the vectors AX, AY, XY system, AR, A5, R5 system. Right? So you see that AX, AR here is cosine of the angle. What is the value of the angle? Well, I know the location of the point in space. I know x, y, and z. So I know cosine of phi. Right? I, l I leave it to you to calculate it. The relation between cosine phi and the location x, y, and z. Right? The same way, uh, a, y, AX, A phi, AX with A phi equals to cosine of pi over 2 plus phi is this angle here, which is minus sine of phi. So once doing that, uh, you can, uh, here we have cosine of phi, which is known. So I'm saying that we know the value of phi, right? Because I know the coordinates in space. Uh, AY, a, a R, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't do this one. Uh, let me see here. I made a X, right? AY, A, R is right here. Which is cosine of this, this angle, which is pi over 2 minus phi sine of phi and a y a phi equals this angle here which is phi equals to cosine phi okay so a y a r is right there sine of phi so it's cosine sorry and a x a phi is minus sine a y a phi is cosine. So we have this relationship. I can write like this. A r a phi a z equals to a matrix relation which is cosine sine zero minus sine cosine zero 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 one a x a y AZ. So you can see that this is a matrix transformation, right? Knowing the components in the X, Y, Z system, I know the components in the R, Phi, Z system. This is a matrix that depends only on the Phi coordinates. I'm going to call it T of Phi. Here I'm going to say that this is the matrix representation of A. I'm going to put a tied, 
tiled uh, on top of A, and say that is represented in the cylindrical system. I'm going to write here this symbol here, R phi Z. Here I'm going to say that this is A in the X, Y, Z system. So what we get is a simple relation. I mean, knowing the point in space, knowing X, Y, and Z, in other words, I don't even, even need to know Z because I can translate Z because the Z component of the vector is not going to change uh, due to that translation unless Z depends explicitly on Z, but not the, not the vector itself. So, in fact, if I know x and y, I know phi, right? And can calculate the transformation. So, it means that A represented in the cylindrical coordinate system is a T of phi matrix times A, x, y, z. That's the relation that we get, right? So, I'm, I'm just writing here to make it a uh, simpler notation here. A, R, phi, Z, I put a transpose just to put horizontal, the notation. I don't need this one, <laughs> in fact. Just need that one. Sorry about that. my tip of my pen. Just fix this in here a little bit. Okay, so uh, that's what we have. So it means that um, uh, we have this transformation law here. A in the cylindrical system is a T of five transformation matrix times A in the XYZ system. This matrix is unitary. There are reasons for that. We're not gonna, going to go through that. Go to African, you can find that explanation why. Essentially, it's because, I mean, those transformation matrices I may mean, have a fixed vector, right? Have a fixed vector. So you just change the, co the, the reference frame, but the vector is, is, is standing, right? The representation, which is different. So, one important property, the magnitude of the vector is preserved. So, matrices that make the transform reference frame transformations don't change the size of the vector. So, that means that those transformation matrices are unitary. So, that's the reason, basically. And, and, and unitary matrices has this property, the inverse of the matrix is the transpose of the matrix. And the determinant of the matrix equals to 1, right? So to find the inverse problem, you can go, um, it's not shown here, but let's do it here. Uh, I mean, if you have this, if you can transform, 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 <laughs> transform is a, is a Brazilian way of saying transform. <laughs> Uh, if you, if you want to go from uh, you know from from the X Y Z system to R Y Z system, you do this, this transformation law here. If you want to go the other way, you just apply the inverse transform, right? So we have uh, T to minus one A R Y Z. But by the way, this is just easy to calculate. You don't have even to to worry. It's just the transpose of phi. Okay. So this t of phi is that cosine sine zero minus sine phi cosine phi zero 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 one. 
And it's easy to calculate the determinants of t, right? Cosine square, zero, right? Um, cosine square, zero, zero, zero. Zero minus minus sine square, which is plus equals one, right? Same thing. So essentially, what we did is this: we have the. I mean, the the change from x y z to r phi z. is to simply change the coordinates the refer to make a rotation. It's a rotation matrix. Right? Because a phi is orthogonal, is this verse here, and a z. So we, may vo we go from, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we go from ax, ay, az, right? And we change to this new system. So we make a rotation of phi radians. And that means a rotation, ma rotation transformation represents by the T matrix. So we have a vector here. It had this representation. You just rotate the reference frame by a small uh, quantity. Then you have a new reference frame, a rotated reference frame. Same thing is going to happen if you have the R theta phi system, okay? I will leave for you to do the calculations, right? What happened now? Let's see if we start with the, with, with the uh, A represented in the R phi Z system. So this would have something like this. Transposed or in vector notation, so we have a r plus a five plus a z, right? Then you wanted to change to a new representation in terms of the spherical coordinates. Vector representation is similar, a r, a theta and a z, I'm oh, sorry, a phi. We don't have to worry uh, with a phi because it has to be the same. This a phi here is the same as the other one. So it's going to be essentially changing a r, a z to a r, capital R, a theta, right? So this transformation, if you look at it, right, it simply we have the system R, A, R, A, phi. You see A, phi is right here. A, Z. So we make a rotation of theta radians to produce now A, R and A, theta. So it's a rotation in the half plane, the semi plane orthogonal to a phi. So we just change versus a z a r that go into versus a r a theta. Doing the same principle, the same algebra, you can show that this transformation can be expressed in this form. A in the new system equals to S of a matrix, which is a function of the polar angle, times a r phi z, and s has this form, okay? So i leave it to you to calculate those uh, terms, which is very easy, just doing the dot product as I did before, assuming known, right, these components here, okay? So s theta again, same property, this is a rotation, right? 
a rotation a z a r go to a r capital a capital r a theta so this is a unitary transformation inverse of s with the transformation matrix is the transpose of x determinant equals to one um just to complete so i i can transform from x y z use matrix representation of vectors i have to append this thing down uh, as a subscript to remember in which system i'm representing those okay so this is gonna be a 35 i mean f sorry this is r phi z sorry about that x y z then we go from cylindrical to spherical and i can go from cartesian to rectangular coordinates to spherical so it's going to be a r theta phi just make the cascade product here oh sorry so this is s S, right? So you're gonna have S times T AX, right? So I can transform directly, right? And also the inverse of this process, AXYZ. I mean, this matrix is also unitary, okay? Has to be, right? It's true. I mean, we go from X, Y, Z. My hand disappears at certain points in the screen, so I'm going to put in front of me here. So uh, you, you, you rotate uh, X, Y, Z. You rotate to produce R, Phi, Z. Then you make this rotation here to produce R, Theta, Phi. So my hand is not... Uh, I have to... Wait a little bit. Okay. So, uh, to make the inverse, we first multiply by S minus 1, then by T minus 1. So, it's going to be something like this. S, T, I'm going to drop the arguments here, to the minus 1. But if you look on this one, I first go S minus 1 first. So this is identity, then I go t minus 1. So this is going to be a x y z equals to t minus 1 of phi s minus 1 of theta a r theta phi. So, or t transposed of phi s transposed of phi. Before concluding this class, let me just make a quick example just to show what a, is a representation, okay? Um, uh, let's say you have a, v a vector in the... make it an example. What is the ver versor AR in the XYZ system? Okay, well, this important example, if I do that, I discover what's the dependence of AR in terms of the angle, azimuth angle, right? Well, let's make the matrix representation uh, AR in the R phi Z system is. 1 a r 0 a 5 0 a z this is the transposed i want to determine which, which who is a r in the x y z system well this is the transposed of t right or t to the minus one if you if you want a r r phi z so that's how I determine A in the XYZ system. 
So this is uh, the matrix. Uh, the, the we have here. I, I just calculated here. What is it? It's in the, zo the zo notebook. This is T five, right? Cosine sine minus sine cosine. Let's suppose just put minus sine in this place here. So that's what we want. Uh, so uh, it's going to be cosine minus sine zero sine. This is already inverse zero 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 one times a r phi z, which is in vertical form one zero zero. This is going to be first row. First column is cosine phi. Second row. Second, first column is sine phi, third row, zero. So, this is AR in the X, Y, Z. In ver vector form, I can write this is cosine phi times AX plus sine phi times AY. That's how we transform it. That's the explicit dependence on the azimuthal angle of AR. It's right there. Okay? Well, I think we are going to close for today. Let's end this class today. We spoke about everything that we wanted to speak uh, on this first lecture. Okay? Uh, we, we talk about uh, representation vectors, uh, basic coordinate systems, the three systems, and the transformation. Okay. Next class, we will continue from that to start doing some, uh, uh, you know, some differentiation and other things with vectors, integration, integration in 3D space. Until next time, bye bye.